I was thinking as a as a general uh, idea of as a general way to talk about sustainable farming. I chose there there are many different versions of what I'm gonna uh, talk here today, but I thought that uh, many of those uh, sustainable sustainable ways to uh, do farming right now are under the umbrella of what we called agroecology. Uh, some people would think agroecology as a uh, science that try to organize our knowledge on ecology and uh, agricultural farming techniques. Some people would think agroecology as something uh, more uh, broad. The, uh, uh, a, uh, a guidance to unite, uh, for example, the social, the technical, and the environmental aspects, the economic and the, te uh, the environmental aspects of uh, food production, food production, for example. So in the, it, it doesn't matter much how we define agroecology. The important thing is, is a, is a, is a, it represents a change of paradigm in terms of how we can uh, make our farms, our land, more productive in a more socially, economically, and uh, environmentally uh, sustainable, in a more sustainable way. Yeah, more sustainable. So. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but uh, before uh, to talk about agroecology, I want to say three things that justify my uh, search for some, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that this is a general, uh, there are general reasons that guide and make some people feel more comfortable about using agroecology as a tool to achieve sustainability, okay? So I'll put the three of them here so we can talk about it. So three important things that really uh, convinced me that agriculture would be uh, a feasible way to achieve sustainability uh, were uh, to know that in the world there is, we produce every year enough food to sustain, to feed a planet and a half. So the, the, the world population now could be fed and some food, half of this food would still, the food produced would still remain. We have no problem with, with the amount of food that we produce every year. This is a very big fat lie produced by the, the companies and the people uh, that profit from the uh, agri-industry, right? So. We have several problems in terms of food distribution, in terms of preserving food, food waste, and mostly we have problems in terms of how we politically think of equality. How do we think, how much we think that's important to share the bounty? How, uh, how do we take actions to make the food reach uh, people? And most important, how do we share the resources of the planet so everyone could have uh, its fair share without uh, uh, any inequality, with any conflict? Th these are the things to keep in mind because uh, once you, you know that this is, this is correct, you feel empowered to uh, uh, take a step and say, look, I'm, I'm going to do something that's considered alternative, something that's a shift in the paradigm of food production because I'm not concerned about feeding the world. If I can feed 20 people around me, it's enough for me. I'll take that as my very humble goal and that would be enough. And I was very happy to see that uh, people here in Hong Kong are taking this uh, step. Yesterday was a, a blast for me because I saw a very small piece of land producing food to sustain, I don't know, I, I would just guess, more than 30 families, three zero. So 
Imagine if, if each piece of land of that same size could be put on use for, to produce food in a sustainable way instead of serving just the leisure of the rich people as a golf, golf course, for example. How many people we could feed and how we could change this idea of feeding the world, right, with agriculture. The second thing that really, uh, that was harder for me to face as a biologist because every biologist want to nature to be preserved and they, in part is a, a, a selfish feeling of I want this to be preserved no matter what. In part is, is a collective thing because you want the next generations also be able to see an elephant, a giraffe, or a, a, a 7,000 years old tree. You want people to see that because you feel uh, accomplished when the next generations are able to see what you saw. Like your kids, for example, be able to take your kid and say, look, I saw this tree for the first time when I was uh, seven years old because my dad took me here. Now I'm showing this to you. It's, it's something that uh, takes us, our emotions, right? But it's difficult to imagine uh, nature being preserved and at the same time the economy being healthy. People, having, people being able to profit without destroying the environment. Right, but this is this is a possibility. This is is not uh, uh, economy versus uh, conservation. This axiom, it's not something. It's not a a uh, sentence that you cannot change. This is is being this way. Is being put forward this way because our way to produce food, for example, but actually to behave as a species in this planet, is always taking nature, nature in a second place, maybe sometimes in the third place, and sometimes no place for nature. So we just think about how much money I can make, how I should be making to, be, to feel safe, to be able to leave uh, uh, something for my descendants. So those things are so important for us that we forget that the basis of our wealth come, for example, from soil and water. It doesn't matter how much, how rich we are, how uh, technological, technologically uh, uh, succeed we are, we will always depend on soil and water to have food. And guess what? We are destroying those two basic uh, uh, sources of life on the planet. Not only for us, but for other species as well. We are destroying the whole planet in, 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 in the name of uh, uh, this in, uneven system that concentrates money, concentrates power, and condemn uh, uh, whole nations to poverty and, and misery. So we should be thinking about this not as an axiom, but as a cooperation. Economy can go well with nature conservancy. We should be thinking that that's, uh, that's a, a possibility. And in order to achieve that, uh, our harmon harmonic uh, cooperation between the economy and the conservation of the environment, we need to search for solutions. And in my very humble opinion, all the solutions are already there. Many others to be discovered or created by our ingenious, uh, highly developed uh, forebrains, but uh, most of them are concentrated in the discipline of ecology. If we take ecology seriously and we, we are able to apply its very basic principles, we are able to change the way we produce food and at the same time give people, return the, the traditional people dignity of life and also uh, promote uh, uh, a sounding uh, environmental uh, conservation. So I think uh, most of the, the, the questions we ask ourselves about the possibilities in, uh, of food, produ food production is, can be answered by ecology or by the, the many ecological techniques we we are uh, able to use. And most, most of these uh, 
these techniques and these ideas or even the, the rationale behind a uh, sustainable way to produce food uh, has been gathered and organized by this discipline, the science called agroecology. So agroecology would be, in this sense, uh, a uh, synonym of uh, sustainability. My pointer just died. But uh, in, the, in the very place where all these uh, different factors meet, in, in the very center of those three circles, would be the, uh, where agroecology uh, acts, right? So we are concerned about the, the environment, we are concerned about the, the, uh, the people, we are concerned about the economy. But we can make all this happen using agroecology as our, our basis to produce food, for example. And we can use permaculture to, to do... Uh, uh, to find uh, alternatives for other needs in our, our lives. For example, uh, building houses, as uh, we, we discussed here another day. Like, why shouldn't we be taking steps towards a more sustainable way to build people's houses? You know? Uh, if, if, if these technologies are available, why they're not being used, right? So permaculture also bring, uh, give us these alternatives for all aspects of our uh, uh, lives in, in order to be more sustainable. So, uh, but there, there is one question, for example, a very practical question that we should be asking ourselves in terms of uh, uh, food production, which is who will replace the elders? Who is going to replace the farmers, the, the current farmers? I don't know exactly the situation in Hong Kong or in China, but in Brazil right now, in average, uh, uh, average farmer is around, the, the person that owns the land and mostly work on that land, it's about 50, 55. And <laughs> given that farming conditions are not nice, I mean, you work under very hard uh, conditions, and it's not valid, uh, valued by the people that buy farm products, we always think about buying fancy telephones and most of us are willing to pay a high price for a fancy telephone that can do all the things. Sometimes are not, is not able to call someone, which is the most important thing, but can do everything else, right? In Brazil right now, that's the, 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 the general picture. But we are willing to pay a high price for a, a, a fancy telephone, but we all think that food should be cheap. And that, only that consideration, only that uh, idea caused a lot of serious consequences, uh, very uh, uh, bad consequences to the farmers. Because sometimes the farmers cannot meet their uh, needs by uh, producing very healthy food for you. Because when, the, when, when he, ex he or she expects to sell that food, that food is so cheap that doesn't pay uh, for the, uh, uh, all the money uh, these farmers invested to produce the food. So we should be really thinking about how we value uh, food, right? And supporting the farmers that are able to give us the best food we can feed ourselves and our families. And I think this answer is very uh, straightforward. Who should be replacing the elders should be the young. Right? Mostly their son, but also other relatives, and even people that are not related to farmers, but want to farm. There is this conundrum right now, this very difficult situation, that uh, if farm is too, a farm is too expensive to buy, some people cannot get in. If farm is too difficult to get out, these people also cannot get in. So... Um, we are in the situation that land is so expensive that someone that is really willing to do farming uh, sometimes cannot. They have the strength that the elders may, may not have now, but they cannot, they cannot afford to buy a farm, for example. And these elders, they, they are not able, for example, to pay 
uh, for workers to do thanks John they're not able to pay the workers to do their uh, the, their uh, their labor because uh, the farm doesn't pay enough so you have this conundrum with this very difficult situation so I think now we should be and that that message go both to the elders and to the young we should be looking for alternatives of getting uh, this force, this young force that's going to replace the elders uh, in terms of partnerships. Elders should be more flexible in terms of uh, uh, embracing young people, willing and strong enough to uh, uh, work on the farms. And the young people should be humble enough to go there and listen more than speak, learn all that's uh, you know those uh, elders. They are actually true encyclopedias about what they know, and we should be paying attention. I shouldn't be say we because I'm not a young person anymore. But the young people should be able to listen to the elders so they can learn all the traditional uh, ways to do farming. Because I really believe that we now. We, we actually pass time to come back to the traditional ways of doing farming. We should uh, rethink what we call the Green Revolution because the Green Re Revolution put forward by the companies and by the rich politicians never gave us uh, what it promised, which was uh, feeding the world, right? So uh, we, we're more than 50 years from the beginning of the Green Revolution and we still have hunger in the world. So Green Revolution is not the solution. The biotechnological uh, revolution being shaped now by transgenic and, and all other this, uh, tec technical concussions is, are not going to uh, feed the world also. So we should be going back to the traditional techniques and improve it with the uh, uh, all these ecological ideas that now we understand much better than in the past, right? So in this way, we can uh, we can afford to uh, bring the young people that are really willing to do farming to the farms and make it productive again, and being uh, uh, peaceful in terms of okay, my land that now is better than it was when I, I first uh, got here. It's past. It's, passing slowly to able hands, hands that are going to care about it and, and improve it for the next and the next and the next generation. Because in the end, we don't own anything, right? We are given a little spark of life that are going to be taken at, at some point. And what we have is today, is this moment. We're talking about this this morning with John. We're having this philosophical uh, uh, conversation about life. Or was, uh, what we have is today, tomorrow is a, a probability, right? So what we're doing with the land now is not for us. Some, we don't plant uh, some species of trees expecting to be resting on its shade. We're doing this for the next generation. So they, they are able to enjoy what we uh, think it's right. It's, it's a better planet, right? So I think that's, that's a moment to think about it and be able to make this really energetic and, and willing people to get in, get their hands dirty, and, you know, just do the most uh, uh, honorable kind of work, in, at least in my, in my view, that's agriculture and farming. So, um, but in order to do so, we, we need to change the way we see food. We, we, we face how uh, our food we need to reconnect with that with something that's so umbilical so important for us that feeds our body every day uh, <clears throat> there's this general idea that uh, in order to feed the world you need you really need to make agriculture uh, in a giant scale in a big scale so food can be so cheap that everyone is able to uh, eat it. But that's not working. We, we are doing that already. We are, we are being successful 
in doing that already. And we didn't feed the, we couldn't feed the world yet. So I think it's the other way around. What we need is rethink our whole system, the whole uh, way we produce food, the way we value the, the, the people that are producing our food. So how about set a goal uh, for, this, for the next year, for example, that less people go to the hospital because they're having food uh, infections uh, or uh, food allergies or less people go to the hospital because they're contaminated by uh, pesticides on their crops, right? How about that for, uh, you know, the goal that you set for a more healthy uh, uh, food system? I, and I think, and generally I, I don't consider that, but I think I'm right. Uh, the way to do that is it's on our hands, the people that buy food, because that's where you can empower your clientele, your, 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 the producers. You can be empowering Monsanto in the moment you eat Twinkies, or you can be empowering Chow, Chow if, you choose to, if you choose him to patronage him and buy his amazing, healthy, nutriently, nutritiously dense food. That's an option. And we are dealing with this option every day. Every time we, do, we, make, we have a meal, we are acting in a political way. And the way we vote, and I think there is, I'm, I'm anticipating, but I think, I think this discussion is, is uh, a little ahead. Uh, every time we eat, we are, we are making choices. Are we going to eat a, a food that's extremely industrialized and is not paying for the someone that should be being paid, like the farmer? Or are we going to give uh, the proper value to the food, the, a food that's healthy and is being produced by someone that uh, is helping the environment and the community around him? So we need to be doing this, we, we should be making these choices every day, every time we, we as citizens go uh, somewhere to buy food. It's happening, so we have this uh, uh, organic uh, market, uh, farmer's market everywhere uh, right now. Uh, I just visit some uh, here in Hong Kong. I think there are several improvements we need to make. For example, uh, I think sh food should be should get a fair price, but I think it's been overpriced in many uh, of these markets. We need to deal with that. We need to talk with the government, for example, about subsidies. Shouldn't the government be subsidizing healthy food instead of highly processed foods? There are several ways we can address this, but I think the way to do, uh, in, 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 the, in the long way, we need to uh, uh, study in order to improve things. We, as consumers, I don't like this word, as clients, we should be able to uh, help the, the whole system to change. And one way to do that is value the traditional communities. So uh, right now I'm, I'm uh, uh, fortunate enough to be in a, in a, inside an institution that has a very close partnership with the, uh, uh, the peasants that were settled by the, the, the government throughout the efforts of the MST. And one of the, the major uh, actions that this institution is taking, for example, is uh, to buy all the food that the institution uh, produce from those peasants, from those small farms, right? So it's a way to value the uh, traditional uh, food that these people are producing, this healthy food that these, pe these people are producing. So a way to support this movement is go back to the traditional food, the, this delicious indigenous food, and say, look, I, I'm going to make this part of my daily meals because that's a way I have to uh, <coughs> support the kind of agriculture I want for the next generations. The, C, uh, the CSAs uh, clubs are another option to do that. So there are several venues to uh, uh, 
that we can use to improve the conditions of the, the farmers. But we should be taking action. We, should, we shouldn't separate ourselves so much of the uh, uh, agricultural systems that we don't feel part of it. Because when we do that, when we trust the government so much to do that, we trust in these uh, corporate boards that take the decisions about food, for example, supporting uh, the, the fertilizer or the pesticide industries, but they don't, they don't live with the consequences of those decisions. We do, because we consume this uh, food afterwards, right? So I think we should be uh, thinking about it. And going back to our friend, Leandro, one of the, uh, the major uh, things that we really dream to do in, in, this, uh, in his uh, neighborhood, in the, in the land that are now taken care of by the, uh, the peasants, is to promote small-scale uh, <clears throat> systems of uh, food production. One of the major that are naturally uh, one of the major systems that they really like the fields is just natural, it's orga organic for them, is uh, milk production. They really like uh, milk production there. And some of them are still insisting in produce beef, but beef in Brazil, beef production in Brazil, the way it's done, it can be, do, it can, it can be done differently, but the way it's done right now, it requires a lot of land and a lot of money. So that's not uh, a, pro a, a appropriate uh, way to produce food when you have a, a small piece of land. The people that own uh, large pieces of land, they can't afford it because that goes to another scale of food production. But milk production in an intensive way that can be done, it's been very uh, well received by then when we, we are able to make the extension service to put this idea forward. And we've been able to do that. There are some uh, uh, projects in Brazil. One of them is called Balde Cheio, meaning full bucket, because as you can see, people in Brazil still milk cows in the traditional way, so they use these buckets and, uh, this, and they uh, uh, collect some amount of milk and put in a, in a, in a tank. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this project is putting forward some techniques to intensify uh, milk production in an ecological way so, and, and in small spaces. So instead of having uh, 100 cows to produce milk uh, in a more extensive way that would meet the, the needs, the economic, the, the economic needs of your family, you can have 20 cows producing the same amount of uh, uh, money or sometimes even more if you intensify your production. That's, one, that's the, the technical part of seeing the same problem. The other uh, way we can see the problem is like it doesn't matter if you intensify your milk production if milk is a, a produce that's not valued, valued by the market, right? So one way to uh, change that is giving milk the right uh, destination, transform milk in something else that we have a, a higher value uh, uh, attached to it. And, and cheese is growing in Brazil right now. Artisanal cheese is becoming a very uh, important uh, uh, food product by, by the, the, the people even in the cities actually mostly in the cities, and a whole, uh, a whole uh, chain of food production related to cheese is being developed in Brazil. I'm sorry, it's in Portuguese, but I can uh, uh, very quickly explain what's happening here. So we have, uh, Minas Gerais is a very traditional state uh, in terms of milk production. Every uh, farmer, small farmer in Minas Gerais uh, and big farmers as well, they are going to produce milk. And some regions like São Roque de Minas, Delfinópolis, uh, Bambuí, all these regions produce uh, their own kinds of cheese. But those cheese are, are being produced there for centuries, but not 
being paid attention by the, the, the urban uh, citizens, for example. But now, in Bra Brazil is living a very, we, we call the, the, the spring of cheese. Because people are starting to see cheese as a very, uh, 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 a kind of, uh, I don't like to say fancy food, but that's what it is. It's a food that people value also as a, a cultural uh, uh, way to uh, be inserted in these communities. In, in the past, we, we did at least one part of the population, a very small part of the population, also considered cheese as a very fancy food, a, a, a food that can uh, pass people the idea that you are a very uh, cultural person, a person that knows a lot about the world because you can talk about fancy cheese. But we always did, we always traditionally did this uh, uh, bringing cheese from France, for example, or from Portugal, or from any other country, Euro mostly European countries that produce uh, traditionally good uh, uh, cheese produce producers. And now we are just discovering, actually rediscovering the potential that Brazil had, the different regions of Brazil can have in terms of producing this amazing uh, artisanal cheese. And uh, the, the movement right now is to uh, it's working into making the 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 the, uh, the peasants the people that produce this amazing cheese being recognized by the amazing product product that they are uh, developing for centuries right so this is a, a, a an idea that we have in terms of how we can value this clean, ecologically produced milk instead of just selling milk as, as the market want to buy. Because cheese, uh, milk is a very uh, difficult uh, produce to uh, rely on because the market basically uh, commands the, its price outside the farm. So it actually influences the price both during the production and after when you sell because the the inputs you need to use uh, to produce cheese can vary in, in, in price a lot. Uh, so that can be much expensive in, during some time of the year or much cheaper in other parts of the year. And the price you're paid by the, the liter of milk in the end can also vary like seasonally. So that's a very difficult, tricky uh, produce if you want to rely on your economy the economy of your farm on, right? So cheese is a different idea. If you can produce cheese and even age this cheese, make the cheese really uh, a special artisanal uh, produce, you can just leave it there and sell whenever, sell it whenever you, you need the money. So it works as a, almost a, a saving uh, uh, account product. But in order to produce, uh, a amount that's enough to meet the, the, the economic needs of the, uh, the farm, you need to use different techniques to intensify the production. So that's what we are uh, trying to work uh, with the, those uh, friends and peasants and ourselves. That's what we, the techniques we apply in, in, the, in uh, some parts of the, the, our farm right now. So we're trying to divide the pastures in, in small paddocks uh, throughout which the, the, the cattle can eat, can eat every day in a different paddock. Uh, and once this, this cattle, the, like the cows, reach the last paddock, the first one is already fresh and productive enough so they can return there and eat again. Uh, Instead of only, and we do this using some very cheap structure like these corridors and electric fence as we can see here. So every day this, these girls, they are going to, they know already what's going to happen by uh, 4.30, 5 p.m. They know or they're already waiting for you on the entrance of the paddock. So just open and they follow you to the next paddock where they're going to meet this fresh grass. So they basically, they are trained to do that. But we used to say that actually they train us to behave in this way. So we, we're going to offer them every day 
uh, a fresh uh, paddock of uh, uh, nutritional grass. Not only the technique of produce, uh, uh, of keep the, the, the herd uh, fed, well fed, well, very uh, nutritionally sustained, but also uh, choosing the right uh, biological uh, resources you're using, both in terms of the, 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 the pastures you're using and the animals you're using, because it doesn't matter uh, you, you can intensify uh, a, a tropical piece of land with the most, uh, the highest technological uh, devices available, but if you put, if, if you using the wrong biological uh, species for that kind of weather and soil conditions and parasites and other kinds of disease, you're gonna fail. So. For example, we, sh we shouldn't be using hosting cows, the ones that are used in Europe, in Japan, or in uh, e the, the United States or Canada, uh, in this kind of situation, because this, that those cows they don't resist much of the, the 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 weather, like the hot and humid, sometimes dry weather, and the parasites that are typical from these areas and the disease that are typical from these areas. But we have a large amount of uh, species that are already adapted to this kind of conditions is they they are being selected for this kind of conditions through millennia by the traditional uh, peasants by the traditional farmers for example in india where this uh, uh, this uh, bread of cow come from the gear or ji Right? So these guys face in India for millennia the same conditions they can be facing in Brazil. So they're going to be naturally more uh, healthy in Brazil. They may not be as productive as the hosting cows, but it's, it's a balance between how much you can produce and how much that liter of milk is going to cost you. Because if you need to spend a lot of money in artificializing the system, and keeping the animal productive throughout uh, 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 medicines or even uh, hormones and all these artificial artificializations, the, the price you're going to pay for that liter that you just produce is really high, so it's not feasible economically. These guys are going to produce maybe half of the amount of each cow that each cow each hosting cow can produce, but each Liter, liter of milk is going to be much cheaper. So in the end, you profit more if you choose the right uh, uh, biological uh, species. <coughs> and together with the, the right biological uh, species, species, you need also to look for where uh, to find the right expertise. And we should be looking for that, not from the, only for the extension uh, service people, but also from the traditional people that uh, produce uh, milk for many generations, right? This is uh, Mr. Zé Mario, Sr. Zé Mario from São Roque de Minas, in Minas Gerais State. His family is producing milk for many generations, and he knows how to do it. So we, <clears throat> uh, I took a course in São Paulo uh, in which uh, uh, the, the person responsible for the course took him from Minas Gerais to Sao Paulo. I, I'm guessing that was a very shocking uh, uh, change in environment for him because he's, this is his natural environment. So suddenly he's in, in the largest city of South America among all those uh, that concrete uh, jungle and among these very fast living people. But he was there giving seminars about how to produce this amazing cheese called the, the canastra uh, cheese and uh, the second section of that course uh, uh, three months later was uh, go to his farm and see how understand how he produced that uh, specific uh, kind of cheese that's very valued in the market right now we have several problems still because uh, the people that are reselling this cheese are still keeping the largest amount of money that the, the clientele is paying 
for the, the cheese, but we're going to deal with that. We're going to, at some point, we're going to resolve that in a way that these guys that are the true artists are going to be able to keep the, the, the largest proportion of this money. This is a, a work in progress already in Brazil. We're taking actions uh, towards it. So these are the, the, the conditions, the minimal conditions they need to produce this amazing cheese. This is the, 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 uh, his little cheese uh, factory. You know, all the minimal uh, hygienic, <coughs> hygienic conditions are met. So people are not allowing animals, for example, to be in these areas or, or flies to enter in these areas. Inside, the, the conditions are very uh, simple but hygienic. So these are the... the the, the equipment used to produce cheese. This is the bench that traditionally used to produce uh, cheese. So when you press the cheese in these benches, they, the, the, <coughs> the liquid that uh, drains from this cheese, from this, uh, the mass of the cheese, oops, the, uh, uh, the mass of the cheese, is going to flow through the bench and it's going to be collected. This is very rich in protein, is, is what we know as whey. And people used to say in Minas Gerais that in, uh, in a farm where people produce cheese, even the dogs are fat. Because whey is a very is a rich uh, uh, kind of uh, food, so you, you can use whey to supplement the, the rations, the, the feeds that you provide to the animals, like the pigs, for example. Pigs, uh, uh, the production of pork goes hand by hand in Minas Gerais uh, with uh, cheese production. Because the whey, which is just a, a, a sub, a, a byproduct of the cheese production, is a major uh, uh, feeding uh, supplement for the pigs. So you can be producing pork and cheese, and that's a very that makes a very healthy farm economy in Brazil. And that's also my goal in the future. I love both species, like the cows and the pigs, and I, I plan to do that. I, I plan to produce the best cheese in my region. And you guys are all welcome to go there and try. I don't know if I, I succeed. You guys just need to go there, try and lie to me, say, oh, it's amazing, even if it's not. And I'm going to produce the best pig meat and hopefully Joe and I will be able to also produce the nice charcuterie uh, uh, <laughs> produce as well. This is a, a work in progress as well. So uh, these people also want to, uh, uh, they, they produce the best chicken you can ever eat. Very different of the Sadia brand of Brazilian cheese you guys sometimes can uh, purchase here in the market had, in my opinion, has no taste. The taste of that the, the chicken would be whatever spice you can put in the pot, right? This is different. These are the the chicken that are raised traditionally in in, in this uh, all communities that you go in the countryside of Brazil, because they part of their diet is made of grass. The the uh, native or introduced grass, but also all sorts of uh, little bugs or earthworms or uh, you know beetles or fly larvae or whatever they can find. They are very, they are amazing hunters. This, I, I don't know about you, but as a biologist, I see these animals as little small dinosaurs. <laughs> because in biology we believe that the birds are just what, re, the, the, the species of dinosaurs that didn't uh, uh, that didn't uh, go extinct, didn't uh, go extinct. So they're very good in finding food. Some of these chicken are, are raised actually without no supplementary feed. That will depend on the conscience and the amount of money the, the peasant has. And w the, at most they're going to provide them the scraps of food from the, their meals. And they're also very good food processors. That's actually the, the food processor of the, in, in a traditional way. So everything that's left from your, your lunch or dinner can be provided to these guys and they thank you very much. They're going to transform this in the most amazing meat or eggs you can ever have. 
So I don't know if you guys have ever noticed, but the yolk of the eggs produced in this way are much darker, almost red, most like or dark orange. If you purchase uh, purchase uh, eggs from the in uh, other industry, they're going to be very ye pale yellow, right? That means a very low nutritional density and that's what we eat like daily right but this is something totally different tastes differently and feeds you differently as well it's the best chicken you can ever try if you go to visit me in brazil we're going to have this several times during your time there so that's a promise uh, some people are also interested in, in do in, in produce their own vegetables uh, the big change we I help to promote there is that traditionally chickens and vegetable production were all in the same area and that doesn't work quite well because the chicken can be very productive as well as they can be very destructive. So if you don't fence them properly or if you don't fence the vegetable plot properly, you can't have both in a healthy way, right? So this is one change that we are, I'm helping to discuss with the peasants and we are being able to uh, promote. And at the same time you have uh, your, your vegetable production, like the, the, your, your garden, you also, you don't need to be uh, exclusive in terms of the area. You can be producing fruits and vegetables at the same time. Again, you just need to choose in the more shady areas the species that are more shade tolerance, uh, shadow tolerance, so they they not suffer from the uh, parts of the day they are not being uh, ha receiving the sunlight. But in the areas that uh, it's more uh, are more uh, receive the, the the largest amount of uh, sunlight, you can just place the species that are more requiring in terms of uh, sunlight, right? So this is another idea we, because in the past, uh, when, when you talk to some of them, they're like, oh no, if you want to produce vegetables, you need to cut all the trees. I said, don't do that, let's, 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 let's try something else. So we propose them to uh, take a small parcel where still they have uh, trees and plant in a more organized way uh, and see what happens. If things go okay, and we always, uh, 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 praying for things to go right, not, no, no, no invasive bugs or any disease happens at that time, at that very specific plot because they'd be blaming us because of the change. If everything goes okay, they're just going to say, oh, it's, it's possible, we can produce this way, let's just do that. Uh, some people are not willing to do that, so what we do is just we take them to the place where we're already doing this for some time so they can see and talk to other peasants about. So they, we call this the, the jealousy technique. So they're gonna, they go there and they say, like, oh, you're doing this, you're producing amazing lettuce or arugula or carrots, um, but how about these trees? They're not shading your production, what's going on? And the person is gonna tell them that, oh no, it's, it's okay, I produce food and, and, and vegetables, uh, fruits and vegetables in the same spot and actually I'm selling this as organic uh, uh, produce and I'm actually uh, being able to profit a lot from it. It's like, oh, I should be doing that as well. That's the effect you expect, like we call the, the jealousy effect or strategy. So <clears throat> this is another venue we, 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 we try a lot to promote there. But in order to have this happening, we cannot rely on what the market offers in terms of, for example, of uh, seeds, right? So another thing that we are trying to do, more and less successful depending on the community that you go and talk with people, is to keep the seeds. Try to preserve the, the traditional uh, uh, seeds. Uh, the seeds that are more resistant to those specific conditions, because when you go to the market, to the conventional market, uh, and buy a bag of seeds, you have no idea of under what conditions the, the, the plant that produced that seed was raised, right? Was uh, uh, cultivated. 
So you don't know if that seed is res resistant to some disease or some weather conditions that you have in the place where you, you're working. So our idea is to try, not, not my idea, this is something that these amazing people are caring for uh, for centuries actually. In, in different ways, we just add some very uh, fancy, fancy technological ways so they, they can do so. so I was just explaining to Chow uh, uh, yesterday that one way they always complain like, oh, but my, my seeds always uh, go bad. They get like a, a fungus on it. They got wasted. I cannot keep them for a long time. So I need to plant it. And that's not always possible. So uh, some of them, the most ingenious ones, they just discovered that they can use this PET uh, uh, bottles. Uh, in, they can recycle them using their then as uh, storage uh, of seeds. So they can just put the seeds there, remove as much air as they can, and then uh, close it and keep that seed, those seeds there for uh, you know many years actually. And a beautiful thing that happened here is that if this man, uh, if his daughter, for example, is going to be getting married next year part of her uh, heritage from his dad are going to be part of these uh, seeds. Not specifically these ones because this is a community seed bank, as, as they call. But his own uh, bank seed, part of it is going to be given to uh, his daughter as part of his, his heritage. And that's amazing because that's, that means the continuity of a cultural tradition that's been kept alive against all our system efforts to destroy it, all against like Bayer, Monsanto, Cargill and all these companies and the politicians and the whole capitalist system in Brazil and other countries, these guys are just try, struggling to survive and they're being successful to do so. so. And these seeds, they are, uh, which for me are the most important input in a, in a, in a, in a farming system, they are being uh, shared by the community to, uh, using these uh, conferences or meetings or regional fairs, open fairs, the markets that they can just go there and bring each of them or each community, bring all their uh, what we call the uh, sementes criolas, the, the indigenous seeds, so they can share with all uh, the other communities. They can make this interchange. So the amazing, the most amazing part of this is not even the, the seeds, but how they interact with each other. And uh, you know, it's just so amazing to see them. Oh, really? Is your that species of bean resistant to that kind of disease that I'm struggling to deal with right now in my, my, my farm? Can I, can I get some? I can give some of my, my corn seeds that are resistant to drought. To the to the dry uh, uh, the long dry season of the of the year, so they're just exchanging not only seeds but experiences about how these seeds can be resistant to different uh, 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 stress, uh, environmental stress or human generated stress. So that's one of the most uh, amazing thing that's happening uh, there right now in some places of Brazil, and. Uh, Another unexpected but very welcome uh, result of these meetings are that the communities get uh, more uh, uh, solidified. They get strengthened, strengthened by the, 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 this feeling of achievement. They feel that they are important, they are doing an important thing because other people are telling them that, that they're, what they're producing is really important for uh, uh, other people people that even don't know them. So they get this feeling of pride and uh, that's been important to empower whole communities in terms of working together as uh, uh, like this community work that I, I just heard about in that meeting we had. The people get together, for example, to build a house or, or, or the house of a whole community. They're doing that also uh, for, to prepare the land and to plant on the this little uh, piece of land. 
that's very important in Brazil right now, and I believe that's important in many places where you have like small family farms, because uh, this each of these individuals, the, the leaders of the families, they're not able to pay for external uh, labor, external workers. But if they get together at every week to work in a, in a in a piece of land of one family, every family is going to have their their uh, land, the piece of land their farms uh, ready uh, to produce in the next, you know, for the next crop or for the next, uh, 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 for the end, to the end of the year. And that's going to be repeated over and over and hopefully uh, this is going to be uh, continued by their, their, uh, their kids as well, right? So even the kids, they are, some of them are here, like, this guy and those guys, they are young people, like 17 years old, and they're going to, to be working on this uh, collective, uh, we call it Mutirão. Uh, it's a, a meeting of all these people to work on the, the, uh, this uh, collective, uh, this particular land, but in a collective way, right? Uh, this is one of the... the, the this kind of work we promoted there. Specifically, what we, we, we seen here are this, the, 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 the plants that are going to become trees, fruit trees and timber trees for people that are, uh, people that are implementing in part of their land the agroforestry. So they're going to uh, 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 devote part of their land to transform it in a, uh, in a forest that also produce food, that produce uh, and also produce wood, because they need wood for se to se for several reasons. They need to build fences. They need to. Uh, some of them use the traditional ovens and, and, and uh, stoves, so they need wood anyway. So why not be planting the, the the your own wood, right? So this is also done collectively by in this uh, village villages. Uh, but all this can only be possible, can only be valid, because this costs money, right? Government money, their own money, or money from people that, like me or other people, are willing to share with them because we believe it's important. All this is made possible because we, uh, in the end of the chain, in, in, when you buy your food, you are supporting this model or other models. So I believe that uh, our eating, every time you eat, you're acting politically. You're voting with your forks, hopefully three times a day. Not for me because I, I don't used to have breakfast generally, but most of people have three meals a day. And that those three meals are actually political uh, acts. You're supporting the farmers or supporting a system that destroy farmers. And I think we should be supporting the first one because otherwise we're producing a series of side effects that we do not sometimes imagine we are part of it, right? So sometimes you, you have very serious uh, ethical issues, environmental issues connected to the way you eat. Sometimes you're very, you, you have several uh, uh, health issues because you're promoting a system, you're supporting a system that, for example, uh, is making us uh, unhealthy. Uh, there is a, a very shocking uh, data from U.S. from the, the moment I was leaving U.S. 2010. That's actually very, it bothers me uh, because I think now it's even worse. Uh, there's this census, this healthy census that tells that this next generation is the one that is going to have a, a lower life expectancy, uh, lower than the previous generation. Isn't that amazing? How we dominate all this technology, all these uh, health technologies and production technologies, but the next generation is going to have less years to live in, as a response of the way they are eating, uh, less healthy. So type 2 diabetes and other uh, obesity and other uh, eating disorders are very common now in U.S. Actually, it's getting uh, big in Brazil, too. It's getting very serious. 
is becoming ser a serious problem in Brazil too. But US is just a, a symbol because they just realize that, oh, maybe my kid's gonna live less than I would because the way I'm feeding them, you know, because the way, the way we produce food with so, so much, uh, so many uh, pesticides, for example, you know, it's just artificial food. And how I process this food after is harvest. So we, we should be thinking about this because we are part of the, the, the system that supports this kind of, all these kind of disorders, like environmental, economical, uh, health, and uh, animal, ethical, uh, in all kinds of disorders. But as this is a very disturbing uh, piece of information, I want to finish in just giving you guys a, a, a some of what you're going to experience in Brazil when you go to visit me. This is the, the typical region I'm living in right now. So this is the Brazilian Cerrado. This is where you should, you should go fast to visit me because this is disappearing. Uh, right now, Cerrado is uh, just the native uh, environment of Cerrado, it's less than 10% preserved. All have been converted in um, uh, soy, uh, soy and, and cattle farmer, farmers, farmers. So, uh, uh, the, the, the most disturbing uh, consequence of this is that Cerrado is the bank, is the water bank uh, for most of the Brazilian uh, water supply. So most of the rivers that uh, provide food, provide water for people in the cities, for example, like São Paulo or, or Belo Horizonte or Salvador, the capitals or Rio de Janeiro, they, they, they are born, they, they uh, the, uh, uh, their springs are on the Cerrado. So it, the, the, the thing I, I, I told you in the beginning that we're destroying just the soil and the water, it's, it's going to generate consequences for people living in the cities. I actually, this is happening right now. Sao Paulo is facing the most serious water crisis and shortage since its whole history. And that's the result of the destruction of Cerrado and Amazon as well, because the, the most of the rains that falls in the Cerrado region comes from the the evaporation of the, the the water in Amazon, and all these things are correlated. So you destroy Amazon and you convert the traditional land Cerrado in soy plantations. You ultimately destroy the the water that you use. To survive in the cities, so uh, it's it's sad, but I believe uh, there are some. I always believe that there is hope, and part of the hope are these guys here because they are the ones that always taught me so much, and they also taught. These are my students from the, the last university I taught, and they always uh, taught me so much about having hope as well because they. They go there after uh, they they keep going to the university to the university uh, facing many uh, different kinds of problems, mostly financial uh, economic problems. But they keep going, and that that feeds the that would feed the the professors at least the ones that are uh, has this uh, goal to make a, a better day for tomorrow. Uh, they keep feeding us with hope because the, no matter what they show up tomorrow they have questions they really struggling to learn and to uh, uh, give their kids a better uh, life so I learned so much from all this my previous uh, students I always try to take them to the field so they can see what's real and what's just what they think is real so this is one of the, the field trips we, we do like frequently along the semester. Uh, this is another group from an NGO that we, uh, me and Luisa, who is, a, who is another warrior in Brazil trying to make things right. We, we always take these guys and give them some messages of hope. But connecting this hope to very simple message, to the message of how we treat the water you, you use in every day. Is it right to be flushing the, the 
toilets with water that it could be drinking. This is nonsense for me, but for most people, it's just take for granted, right? We do that all the time. And in the in the third lecture, I'm going to talk about some alternatives. How can we do it, do some things in a different way so we can take part of the 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 changing of all this, right? Because sometimes we think that because we are in, in the city, in the, we live in the cities, we we're not able to take steps towards. Uh, being part of the, the changing, but we can. Actually, I was very happy to know that here in Hong Kong, some places use uh, s uh, the, the seawater, the, the water from the ocean to flush the toilets. It's an advance. I don't know how it's done, I don't know the consequences, but at least we're not using drinkable water to do so. I think this is, uh, these are small parts that can be put together to resolve a more complicated uh, problem. So with that, I just thank you guys again and I'm open for questions.